Every three years, uh, pastors are expected to do boundary training to help uh, prevent sexual misconduct in the church. And the training has changed a lot over the years. Years ago, it was, it was a, basically a list of cover your butt things to do so that you can never be accused of anything. Right? Do this list and you should be okay. Right? Make sure that there's a window in your office. Never meet with anybody in the church by yourself. All those things. Now, in more recent years, they, they're like, you know, this training isn't going to do anything for somebody who's a predator, right? So let's, let's, it's more geared to, for preventing sexual misconduct and the idea of not for pastors not to have affairs. And what's fascinating, and I had never thought about this, they said just for, for clergy, if they have an affair, it's not just they could lose their marriage and, and, and strain the relationships with their family. They lose their job. You lose your means of providing for yourself. You can lose everything. There's so much at risk. And then they have interviewed and asked clergy who have, you know, who have fallen to temptation, right? What happened? And you know what their answer is? I don't know. That, I, I, it just happened. I don't know. So now the training is pay attention to your life. <laughs> the, to, this is just like accenting. The Holy Spirit is going, yes, with everybody. Yes, amen. All right. Uh, pay attention to your life. And we start get, we're asking, you know, because a whole centered, grounded person is paying attention to their life and they're not, it, things just don't happen, right? So, so boundary training now asks you questions like, are you exercising regularly? Are you eating well? Do you take your day off? Do you take all of your vacation? What do you do for fun? Do you have a date night with your spouse? Do you have friends outside of the church? Pay attention to your life. And by the way, I, I coach other pastors. I'm asking that question. But when we went into COVID, it all turned into self-care. It all turned into, what are you doing to be okay? What are you doing to, for yourself? What are you doing to stay sane? What are you doing? So we are in part two of a sermon series. Uh, it's a, our stewardship series. And it's, uh, it's called Enough, Cultivating Joy Through Simplicity and Generosity. And today's uh, sermon title is Wisdom and Finances, Finances and Wisdom. And it's basically pay attention to your life. Pay attention to the choices that you are making. Pay attention to your finances. Uh, let's talk about two different parables. First, the one from Scripture about the prodigal son. Only recently, uh, in recent years, did I learn what the word prodigal means. I had always assumed that it meant rebellious or some, I think, uh, I read that some people assume that it meant somebody who gets lost, wanders away. It actually means somebody who's a spendthrift, somebody who just wastes their money. That's the prodigal son. And in, and in the story that we're meant to learn from, he uh, goes and spends everything and then he comes to himself. And he realizes, you know, the servants in my, in my father's house are in a better position than I am. Let me go home and ask for mercy, right? Last week, we were talking about ways that we enslave ourselves. And are we making the decisions that lead to freedom or and slavery, becoming slaves to the bank? So let me tell you a modern parable. Years ago, I went to a PW, a Presbyterian Women Christmas party, and Jane... You like God bless you, Jane. Jane is now with the saints. So it's my soul sister. She came up with this with this game. She took the uh, the flyer from the Sunday paper from the local shop, right? And she picked out seven items, and then we all had to guess how much they cost on sale. Okay. How how much they cost, and then at the end of it, whoever came closest to the actual retail price would win the game. So the conversation at my table was, I don't even look, or I know what I like, so I just grab those things. I you know, I'm, 
I'm not going to win this game. And the two women who came within pennies of, of, the, of the total were the two poorest women in the room. And I have never forgotten that. They knew what everything cost because they had to. Studies have shown that the more people make, the more, pe the more money that they waste. And that's why we call it disposable income. So with the idea of being more, attention, more intentional, paying attention, we can make choices that, that, that free us or enslave us. Now, I want to say this. Last year at the church that I was serving, we did the stewardship campaign. And the stewardship elder, after you, know, you get all the, the cards back, and, you know, and every year there's the call to all the usual suspects, Right to say, you know, hey, can we count on on your giving for the year? And he reported back to the session nearly in tears that because of COVID, there were people who had no income since March. I'm going to be talking about tithing in 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 the coming weeks. Tithing is when you give your first fruits to God. You know, you, that your 10 percent um, from the beginning, and then you set your family's budget up. After that, you've done that. 10% um, of nothing is nothing, right? And, um, and this talk, none of this is meant to slap any hands or there, you know, there is absolutely no admission price to be part of this, this fellowship, to be part of this worshiping community, none. Um, I always say to folks, you know, if, if you've got nothing to give, don't stay away. Please don't stay away. Um, I know from personal experience that if unemployment should hit your home, you know, there's a pause button that's hit on your giving. While, and the first bill to get paid is your mortgage. <clears throat> Absolutely get it. While you figure out who's who and what's what. <clears throat> Absolutely understandable. So we're going to be having these conversations, but with the understanding, you know, this is a personal conversation. All of this is meant to help free us, not, not for us to, there's no guilt trip here. There's no, you know, there's no punishing God ready to slap our hands or anything like that. We are making, all of this is so that we pay attention to our lives and we are making choices that, that can free us so that we might know peace, so that we might sleep at night, that we might know simplicity and joy. And you can ignore everything that I'm saying, and that's fine. But all of this is offered in a spirit of love to help build us up and free us from all that, from all, because the world will tell us that we need this, 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 and this to be happy. And it's a lie. So looking at our lives, looking for what is, what is a lie and what is truth. That is what all this is about. And again, this is very personal. This is between you and God. And all of these lessons are not meant to be start suddenly looking at other people like this. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I have a friend uh, who I grew up with, and she is a social worker. And she does not have a lot of money. And she, and she posted this on, you know, on Facebook years ago. The one thing that she does for herself is get her nails done. It's her one indulgence, but it makes her feel human, right? And it's a good reminder that everybody needs something so that they don't feel like they're deprived all the time. And, and I remember, why do I remember that? Because I have been in the food pantry with, 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 with the ladies and, and, and where somebody says, did you see her nails? Hmm. And here's another conversation. I got lots of stories this morning. Uh, here's another story. A woman came into my office from having come from the food pantry. And, 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 and I just want to say food pantry, that type, that type of ministry, everyone, sometimes people need to take a sabbatical because you know, people can get salary. But this woman comes into my office, Pastor Robin, can I talk with you? Sure, absolutely. She's like, can I tell you about this, this coat? She was wearing a leather coat. She goes, before I became an alcoholic and a drug addict, I was a successful businesswoman. And this coat is the only thing that I have left from that life. And darn if I'm going to be judged by those ladies because I have one nice thing. Am I not allowed one nice thing? Sorry.
right? And, you know, so grace, 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 and then go talk with the ladies, <laughs> right? So let's not waste time this morning worrying about whether this is, you know, whether this can be universally applied or whether we can think of exceptions for the rule. This, you know, and, and therefore it doesn't apply to us. It all of this is being offered up in love so that we might know freedom and peace. Pay attention to your life, pay attention to the choices you are making. Look at your bank statement at the end of the month. Look at your credit card bill at the end of the month, and it will tell you a story. It will tell you what your values and your priorities are. Another story. A friend of mine, her brother, is having a business dinner, and at the end, he pulls out his credit card, and it gets declined. And he was embarrassed. And he's like, oh, my gosh, somebody must have, have gotten the number. Let me, let me call. Call American Express. And the person on the other side of the line said, it's your wife. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, I know. Uh, he goes, we pay off our credit card bills at the end of the month. And please cancel the card. And the person said, I will do that for you. I will cancel the card. But I'm telling you, it's your wife. Well, come to find out. You know how you get those solicitations? Transfer your balance. And 0% for, for so long. Yeah. Do you know how many of those you can open? Yeah. And that's what she'd been doing. And I would like to say, you know, I would love to say that it was a wake up call for her. My best friend did the same thing to her husband, and they're, you know, this is just what women do. The lies we tell ourselves. Some people should not have credit cards. And don't feel, don't, everybody, everybody, everybody has something that can be their undoing. You will hear me say that a lot. Everybody has something. For some people, it's the credit card. That it's just not healthy for you. The same way some people can't handle alcohol, some people cannot handle having a credit card. Some, cut it up. Some people need to be cash on the barrel. Another story. Mabel not a real name, uh, sat down with her one time. This is somebody, a QVC, Home Shopping Network person, somebody who's known to say, I just had to have it. I saw it and I just had to have it. Um, and I always wondered, how did she do that? I mean, her husband must have left her some kind of pension. Oh my gosh, right? Sat down with her one time and she told me I had to cut up the credit cards. And that she had gotten to the point where she was just able to do the minimum payments and had to uh, eat some humble pie and talk to her daughter and say, help. And the daughter helped, but it, it also meant cutting up the credit cards. And this is what I remember. It was like talking with somebody who got sober after 30 years, right? Some people cut them up. And um, in, these, in the resources that, that I'm using for this, it's talk about, I had never heard of this. Uh, there's some folks, and, and maybe some of you do this, you organize yourself by putting money in envelopes, right? This is the money for the groceries for the week. This is the money for the clothes for the week, or for the month. These are the money for, the, for gas. This is the money for you know, all of that, and that's the way to do it. So that's, that's, your, that's how they budget. Right. And, and I shared this years ago and this woman came up to me and said, Oh my gosh, Robin, I've been doing that for years. And it's the only way that I could stay married. <laughs> right. Because, because, you know, everything she was with my husband, he can't have a credit card. So honey, here's the money for you to go out with your friends. And when that money is gone, that's it. Right. She so, so it kept us out of the poorhouse and kept us, you know, kept us happy, kept us honest. Right. So if you look at your expenses at the end of the month, it will tell you, tell you stories. There's two things that usually get us. One is impulse buys. So the, to ask to pause, again, hit the pause button and say, uh, wait, wait 24 hours, wait a week. Are you still thinking about that thing? Do, you know, do the whole question. You know, treating yourself every once in a while is, is fine. But if you're putting yourself in the poorhouse because of that impulse, you know, learn to, to pause. 
And the other thing that, that um, also undoes people is eating out. Now, of course, COVID shifted all of that. Um, it, before COVID, people were eating out uh, on average six times, um, and that's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So it's not dinner every night. Although I, I have those friends who, who don't cook at all, uh, but the you know, but six times. But it, because of COVID, it was affected. Now this is uh, this I find fascinating. I read an article that says the benefits of home cooking is healthier to cook ourselves. Um, it's also, you know, if you're living with a family to have the, the, the family time around the table, it's better for your family to be sitting around a, a table together. Uh, but this, this fun fact kills me. If you entertain and have a dinner and you serve a vegetable, people will think you're a better cook and they will think you're a better person. I just think that's hysterical. I was raised by a home ec teacher. What do you mean? People are not serving vegetables, <laughs> right? You are a better person if you're, if you're serving vegetables. I think that's hysterical. So all of this is interesting, but let me highlight that this is spiritual work. How we live our lives, every decision, you know, people want to relegate spirituality to just like a corner of your life. No, it, it, it encompasses everything. How we treat other people is, is based on your faith and your spirituality. How you pe- treat other people when you're in your car <laughs> is a spiritual decision. When you're angry, sp- you know, how do you react? You know, I, I joke now. I'm just like, darn it, they're making me pray for them. Shoot, you know, because I'm working on that, right? So, I mean, but every decision that you make is a spiritual decision. So how you, the use of your finances is a spiritual decision. It's an expression of our belief system. Quoting uh, Pastor Adam Hamilton, we are to use our resources to help care for our families and others, to serve Christ and the world through the church, mission, and everyday opportunities. We have a life purpose that is greater than our own self-interest. And how we spend our God-given resources reflects our understanding and commitment to this life purpose or mission. You know, all that we have, we believe, comes from God. And with discernment, looking to God, is how we spend. So you go to your doctor once a year for your annual. You should go to your doctor once a year for your annual, right? (laughs) This is your annual at church reminding all of us to pay attention. Pay attention to your life. Pay attention to your finances. Do a tune-up if necessary. But ask yourself the question, does your spending support God's values or those of the culture? And again, the culture will tell us that our our job is to consume and to make as much money as possible, possible to blow as much money as possible, and the one with the most toys at the end wins. Living simply so that we can be more generous is countercultural and ultimately a blessing because getting to help other people from our abundance gives joy. So um, I don't know the last time you did it, but I encourage you to sit down and have that reality check and remember simplicity and generosity lead to joy. Studies have shown and the faithful can witness in Jesus' name. Amen.